So 80 to 90% of a professional trader's time at an investment bank, it's not spent actually taking or trading positions that they want to have. It's spent market making and monitoring algorithms. The machines in market making have replaced humans in the business. There's no skill in market making anymore. Now we're going to come on to pay later, what people get paid at investment banks, but it seems pretty logical that if the commission is down 80% over the last decade, what do we think pay is down? It's down roughly by the same amount. But first we're going to look at prop trading. Prop trading is pretty much 10% of a trader's time at an investment bank. That's using the bank's money to make money. Why do you think the bank would give the trader capital to enable them to take positions? Obviously to make money, but why do they want them to make money doing this? Think about that negative selection portfolio. Over many, many trades, over a year, over a financial year, there will always be a loss in doing business with clients because they still have to commit capital. So they will always lose some of the commission over the year. And they'll always have the, the negative selection portfolio throughout the year. But why do you think the bank gives them money to trade on a proprietary basis? Any guesses? Exactly. So the bank gives them a pot of money to trade with in positions that they want to have. So they allow them to, t to have or invest in a positive selection portfolio. And that number that's given to them is designed to make a return that outweighs the loss committing capital and doing business with clients. So that example earlier, 50 million commission over a year, lose 10 million of that commission doing business to generate the business to come through the door. The bank may, might give you 50 million to make the 10 million back in positions that you actually want to have. And typically, and this goes against pretty much all perceptions outside the industry, typically they're running long short portfolios with one to three month time horizon. They're not actually going in and out of the market every couple of minutes, every couple of hours, trying to make money quickly. They're actually holding positions for a long time. So they're running portfolios. So the purpose is to try and make that money back. But it's also linked to the trader's bonus. That's where the trader gets paid their bonus. If they make money, proprietary trading, in positions that they want to have, that's where their bonus comes from. Now if commission is the bread and butter of the business, and it's down 80% in the last 10, 12 years, what do you think the number is in terms of what the bank gives traders to enable them to trade with in the proprietary trading account? How much do you think that's done? About the same. Because that commission number at the bank is collateralized to enable the traders to take more risk. So if that's down 80%, the number that they give to the traders is down 80%. These days you'll be lucky to get $50 million even as a senior trader. Whereas junior traders 10 years ago were getting $250 million. So they could actually earn a bonus. 
So that means all things being equal, bonuses are down 80%. Am I depressing people here? You don't need to get depressed. You've just got to deal with the market that you've inherited. When I joined the industry in 99, well, in all times or points in time, it's a trader's job to follow where the opportunities are, where the money can be made. In 98, 99, when I was applying to investment banks, it was valid because investment banks were places where you could make a lot of money. It's totally changed now. What you've got to do now is deal with the market that you've inherited and still follow where the opportunities are. But we'll come on to that later. Let's have a look at how the secondary markets division is set up. If you think banks are, or investment banks are places where everybody makes loads of money, you'd be very mistaken because the vast majority of people are actually in support functions. The ratio of a profit center, somebody who actually brings money into the company, and somebody who's a cost center, for every one person that's a profit center, four people are a cost center. There's four in support. And the secondary market side kind of works like an upside down pyramid model. The traders hold everything up. The traders are still the most important people. They're in control of the bank's balance sheet. <coughs> They're the gatekeepers of the bank's balance sheet. What they say happens. So what you see at the top is actually what's right at the bottom, the support function. So we've got support, technology, compliance, and operations. Typically, a global secondary markets business at a top investment bank will have about 3,000 of these people. They don't bring any money into the company. They're a cost center. And they're viewed internally as a cost center. They get the lease pay. The first profit center, and I'm going to use the term loosely here, is research analysts. The guys that write the proprietary research or the bank's research on the assets, on publicly traded assets. I'm using the term loosely because increasingly they're less and less and less of a profit center because the old business model is now dead. The old business model was pension funds and hedge funds used to pay for research. They used to pay directly for research. They don't anymore. They then used to pay for research in the execution business via commissions. But they can execute everything themselves now and they've got their own in-house research. So they don't pay for research anymore. There's still a few figurehead research analysts knocking about on Wall Street and in the city who still get paid OK, but the vast majority get paid nothing. Basic salary and a small bonus, because that side of the business is dead. They bring very little money into the company anymore. The first real profit center is in sales, and that's hedge fund sales, not long-only sales because long-only sales rely on the research business model. There's only a couple of them left at each investment bank. They've all gone. Why? Because there's no opportunity to make money. They don't get paid. Hedge fund sales, they're the first real profit center on the secondary market side, because what they're doing every day is speaking to the hedge funds and they're coming up or generating trade ideas. And the hedge funds are more active. So the opportunity to be there to make money still exists, but it's still down massively versus 10 years ago. That it's right to call them a profit center because they bring money into the, into the firm. So a guy comes up with an idea as a hedge fund sales, hedge fund sales guy. They put the trade idea into the hedge fund the hedge fund decides they want to do it. Naturally, through the execution business, commission is paid. So they can add incremental dollars to the business. The next profit center, and it's a supposed profit center, is the sales trading function. 
sales traders are part of the execution team, the execution business, and they sit opposite or amongst the traders. And they're speaking to the dealers at the pension funds and the hedge funds. So when, in that example, up the Apple example, the $10 million example, when the pension fund manager decides they want to top up their portfolio in Apple and they want to buy $10 million, they call internally or send the order down to their dealer internally at the pension fund. The dealer then sends it to the sales trader. The sales trading function is very defunct compared to what it used to be. Because it used to be on a relationship basis and also on a paid research basis. Because the, the pension funds and the hedge funds, <coughs> the pension funds and the hedge funds were paying for the research. So they'd get lots of business coming through. And they used to be able to add incremental value to the business. They can't now. So they now get paid very little. So imagine the situation where the dealer at the pension fund calls the sales trader. The sales trader picks up the telephone. And the dealer says, I want to buy 20,000 Apple at $500. Sales trader says, OK clicks the back of the phone, puts it on mute, and asks the trader. The trader decides. If the trader says yes, he clicks the back of the phone and says, yes, you can buy 20,000 shares in Apple at 500. And they put the phone down. Really, the sales trading function in the noughties, or the late 90s noughties, was a rebrand for the term order clock. Someone who takes the orders. But how do you think the traders view the sales traders in a business sense? Well, when the trader wants to do something, they advertise it. So when the trader wants to short $10 million of Apple, that can be advertised. It can actually be advertised directly to the clients via software, so it bypasses the sales, tra sales traders. But somebody still has to be there to pick up the telephone. So when the trader wants to do something, they view the sales traders as distribution. So they empower the sales traders to go out and bring business into the company. But really, they're just an extension of what the trader wants to do. So it's the trader who's really bringing in the money. Now think back to those numbers where commission's down 80%, proprietary trading is down 80%, bonuses are down 80%. That's the traders. That's in the last decade. That's the traders, and they're the most important people on the trading floor. Everyone has to speak to the trader. If you want to know something, you have to go through the trader at some point. They're the guys, they're the glue that holds everything together at the investment bank. What do you think the rest of the guys get paid? It's worse. The trader is the best career opportunity at the investment bank, still. But it's down 80%. So when you get the corporates coming in, Investment banks coming in and saying, we've got a great program in the uh, technology compliance and operations department that you should be joining as a graduate. You need to be asking them some serious questions. Because all those guys rely on the commission business. And they don't bring money into the firm. And if that business is in structural decline and continues to be, it's finished. You don't have a career opportunity. You need to understand this. This is what they're not going to tell you. Let's move on from investment banks, but we'll come back to them. What does a professional trader at a hedge fund do? First and foremost, protect the capital of their clients, so their investors. Make money in rising and falling markets. The professional traders are known as portfolio managers, PMs. 
and their only function is positive selection portfolio. Positions that they actually want to have. There's no market making activity. Their function is similar to the proprietary trading function, but it's 100% of the time. The only difference is just the nature of the business they operate in. So let's have a look at the differences in the nature of the business. So investment banks, where does the capital come from to allow an investment bank to operate? They're public companies. They've got public shareholders. When you invest in the investment bank's stock or their debt, if you invest in the investment bank's stock, you're giving them money to go out and generate business in primary markets and business in secondary markets. That's what you're doing. You're providing the capital for them to do that. What you do with a hedge fund is different if you invest in a hedge fund. So what are these guys doing? Well, the clue is in the name, hedge funds. They, they're usually hedged. They're hedging out risk. And they've usually got diverse, long, short portfolios. And really, a hedge fund is just simply a business structure. If you have a certain type of structure, you're a hedge fund. So it's just the way the business is structured. And there's two entities that you really need to focus on for the purposes of today. It's the management company and the offshore fund. So you have an onshore management company and an offshore fund. The management company, company typically charges 1% to 2% to manage the assets under management, the AUM. And an annual performance fee is charged on the fund, on the assets of the fund, when they make money. But something that most people don't realize is that performance fee doesn't automatically just go out of the fund and everyone gets paid a big bonus and everyone goes home. Funnily enough, the investors want to see the hedge fund manager invested in their own strategy and happy to invest every year. So typically what you will see in the mandate of the fund, in the term sheets, before an investor invests, they'll want to see that the portfolio manager is contracted to reinvest their money all the time into the fund every year. So typically, they'll be reinvesting at least half of the performance fee back into the fund every year. So what does that mean? It means they trade their own money. Banks, investment banks, traders there, trade public shareholders' money. Professional traders at hedge funds trade their own money and outside investors' money and charge a performance fee and a management <coughs> fee to do so. Now, because the hedge fund trader is spending 100% of their time on the, on the positive selection portfolio, so there's no market making, their trading and investment process is a lot more sophisticated than the guys who are prop traders at investment banks. They're much more thorough in what they do. This is the structure that you can go through of a typical hedge fund when you get the presentation. But for the purposes of today, because we've got a bit of limited time, just to understand the onshore management company and the offshore fund. So let's have a look at the, an example of a billion dollar hedge fund. A hedge fund that's got a billion dollars of assets under management. We're looking at this because the billion dollar number is the number in the industry that's considered to be the level at which you've arrived as a hedge fund. Below that, everybody's trying to get to a billion dollars. That's the golden number. 
So typically you can start off with 50 to 100 million dollars these days. It's still quite difficult to get, but you're aiming to grow in two, three, four years up to a billion dollars. That's when, it's, that's when you've considered to have, to have arrived. What are they actually doing? Well, in this example, we're looking at a fairly conservative $1 billion hedge fund holding 25 positions long and 25 positions short in their portfolio. So they've got a self-imposed position limit of 2% of assets under management. So no single position can be over $20 million. And that will actually be in the terms of the fund before the investor invests. It's one of the reasons why they're investing. And they're targeting a 20% return with mid-teens volatility, 15% volatility. So it, it's logic that you would want to get a 20%, if you're targeting a 20% return, you would rather invest in somebody who has 15% risk and achieves 20 than somebody who has 40% risk and achieves 20. These numbers will be in the mandate and the term sheet as well of the hedge fund. It's the reason why people invest. So in this example, they're charging investors a 2% management fee. Just for the record, 2% is very high. So this hedge fund's getting away with charging 2%. 1% is the industry standard. And they're charging a 20% performance fee. So they're making 20 million in management fees and 20% on the performance, 200. So they're making 40. And then 50% of that performance is reinvested by the managers. So at the beginning of next year, the $1 billion fund, fund becomes $1.16 billion. 40 million has left the fund. 20 million in management fees and 20 million in performance fees. Now let's think about that management and performance structure. First of all, let's deal with the management company. The management company is onshore and invoices the fund offshore for the management fee annually. Why? Huh? Who spoke? <laughs> Tax? Yeah, we can come to that in a second. That's one reason. But what's that 20 million used for? Yeah, the 20 million is used for all the infrastructure of the fund to run that fund, including basic salaries of everybody in the office. I'm glad you brought up tax because we'll move on to the performance fee now. Where's the performance fee invoiced? Offshore. Because the fund sits typically in an offshore tax haven. No one likes paying the tax, least of all the investors. So they invest in the offshore entity and the traders charge the performance on the offshore entity. Then they don't need to bring it onshore. They can reinvest it and keep profits offshore. So what does all this mean for you guys? The professional traders at investment banks and hedge funds, now we understand what they typically do. Well, everybody here, pretty much 90% of you at the beginning of the presentation, put your hand up and said you're going to apply to an investment bank for an internship or a graduate position at some point in the next year. Well, first of all, you clearly don't understand what you're dealing with, because if you did, you wouldn't. And if you've got a degree and you spent 50,000 pounds on it, you need to know what you're dealing with. So let's summarize it first. Hedge fund managers use their own money to trade. 
they reinvest and they're invested in their own fund. They also accept outside investors' money and they charge to do that. Traders at investment banks don't. They trade public shareholders' money. And they spend 80 to 90% of their day managing a commission revenue business and trading out of positions that they don't want to have. It's a totally different function. The commission business at investment banks, unfortunately, has been in structural decline for over a decade. It started in 2002. You just shouldn't believe what you read in the media because they have a different agenda. They want you to buy the newspapers, they want you to watch the television and watch their program to get ratings, and they want you to hit their website. So they will sensationalize everything. Your perception is completely misguided. In this market, senior professional traders at most investment banks don't get paid more than $300,000 a year. That's basic plus bonus. Junior traders get significantly less. And both of them exist month to month. So we're talking about putting their card in the ATM machine at the end of the month, and it says zero or has a negative balance. They exist. Because the senior traders have all got whopping mortgages in central, west, north London, wherever. Their kids are in private school. They've got expensive lifestyles. What goes in, goes out. It has another consequence for you that you need to understand. If there's no opportunities to make money at investment banks, do good traders go and work at investment banks? No, they've all left. They've all gone to hedge funds. They've all left or left the Western world altogether, or they're operating in the Western world and doing their own thing and trading their own money because they can make more money doing that than working at an investment bank. What does it mean for you guys? It means your expectation of the training that you're gonna get when you go to an investment bank is completely misguided. Because you're gonna be learning from the crap. The, all the guys that are left over who can't move to hedge funds, who don't have the talent, who don't make money trading, and don't have enough money to trade with their own money. That's what's left. You're going to be sitting next to them, learning how to trade off them. And they don't even know how to do it themselves. Because all they do is stick things in a machine. There's also another consequence to this. And we call it in the industry, the race to zero. These algorithms, which are so prevalent in the industry and we have a gentleman here, Corvin. Corvin's a hedge fund manager who's down here to talk to you today about that later. We'll go over the basics here. The algorithms have destroyed all short-term opportunities in publicly traded assets to make money. Because that example that we looked at before, where the machine is buying on behalf of the client $10 million of Apple at 500, there's machines built to predict what that machine is doing. And they buy the Apple before the machine buys it and sells it back to them at a higher price. And there's machines built to predict the machine that's predicting the machine that's buying Apple. So how many trades do you think the, uh, an algorithm can do in a second? Someone throw a number at me. A couple of thousand? A couple of thousand? 
It will stay in the thousands. <laughs> they haven't quite built the millions one yet. So you're looking at about 15, 20,000 for decent algorithm. How many can a, a human do? One. Right, humans literally don't stand the chance. This race to zero is everything in a short space of time. So we're talking a, a second, a minute, 10 minutes, an hour, a day. The human doesn't stand the chance. The machines have replaced humans on electronic exchanges in anything under a day. You don't stand the chance. And if you look at implied volatility of publicly traded assets over the last 12, 15 years, it's just gone like this, constantly down over short time horizons. And that's what we call the race to zero. Because all these machines are competing all the returns to zero over short spaces of time. So you either need to become the best programmer in the world if you're going to be successful in trading, or you go where the opportunities are. And the opportunity now is not to go to the investment bank and make money over one day because volatility is really high. Those guys stick things in machines. The opportunity as a human is to add value by learning how to manage portfolios and trade portfolios over one to three month time horizons, longer time horizons, because the machines can't do that. Humans can do it. So that's where you add value as a human. It also gives you another strong message. All the good guys are leaving or have already left. And now they're trading either at a hedge fund structure with their own money or they're trading in other structures with their own money. They're sending you a very strong message. You need to trade with your own money. If you want to be a professional trader, that's what you have to do now. You can't go to an investment bank and trade with publicly available shareholder money or public shareholder money and get away with making tens of millions of dollars. It's not available anymore. It doesn't exist. 